Hello, congregation, family and friends. I pray that all is well with you today. Today, I'm going to talk to you about humility. Yes, humility, something that all Christians should have. Matter of fact, everybody should have little humility in their life. There's all too little humility in the world today. But I'm going to also not just talk to you about humility. I am going to show you a man who was truly humble and show you by example. We are in the Gospel of Mark on these Sundays. This is sermon number four of my expositional series in the Gospel of Mark. And we are in today, we are in Mark chapter one, verse seven. And I've titled this sermon, John's Humility. John's humility. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just read the verse. We're only looking at one verse today, but as I was studying this verse this week, there is so much packed into this one verse that this is all we're going to be able to get to today. So if you're with me, sermon number four, Mark 1 verse 7 says this. Now we're talking about John the Baptist. We haven't gotten to Jesus yet. We've been working on John the Baptist throughout these early verses of Mark. So here is John the Baptist. It says, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. That's it. That's our verse for today. What I want to do is break it down a little bit for you and then ask you and me some questions that we have to think about when it comes to humility. First of all, if we go back and we see that John was a preacher, he says he preached. John just wasn't a voice crying in the wilderness. He wasn't just some weird kind of guy that was out there near a river that was dunking people in the river. He was essentially a preacher. And what he had to preach was the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't ever think that John was just some oddball character that God used. He was a preacher in every sense of the word. And God doesn't mince words when he says, and he preached. Jesus was, John was preaching part of his part of the gospel. Now, let's break down his statement here because this is, in, this is essential to understanding again who John was and who was coming after him. It says, and preach saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me. Let's break that down. He says, there cometh one. It's present tense. Coming meaning immediately. He's already present. Remember, Jesus was already there. He had not started his public ministry yet. In a few verses, we'll see next week, Lord willing, we'll see where Jesus is baptized. And then his public ministry takes off as John's ministry fades away. But what John is saying, there's coming one. There's coming one soon. That's something that also we say to people, look, Jesus is coming. You better be ready for him. Jesus is coming back. You need to be right with him. So John is saying at this point back then, he's telling people, yes, I'm baptizing you. He said that back in verse 5 when we looked at that. I'm baptizing you in the river, but there's coming one who is mightier than I. John is taking the emphasis off of himself and putting it on Jesus Christ exactly where it should be. Notice he says there cometh one See the word one? It can only be Jesus. There's only one God, one Savior, one Lord, one Redeemer. There can only be one. There's not multiple Saviors, not multiple Redeemers. John is saying there cometh one, one person. And you and I, if we are true believers today, we know that there's only one Lord and Savior, one Redeemer. That's Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of people in the world that think there's other ways to get to heaven that there's other uh, means to get into heaven outside of Jesus Christ. We know that that is wrong. And we need to witness to these people to say, look, there's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. Only one. John is emphasizing here, there cometh one. One. Let's continue with his statement. There cometh one mightier than I. Mightier. When we think of the word mighty, what do you think of? Think of strong. Think of strength. I, here's a few thoughts. Jesus was mightier. He was stronger to baptize, to save, to punish. He was the deliverer. He was the judge. Jesus was and is also mighty God, almighty God. His ministry would be greater and with more authority, more miraculous miracles, more signs and wonders. Whatever John was doing, whatever we saw in the Old Testament, Jesus was mightier than all of them. As you read through the Gospels, when Jesus can raise people from the dead, 
when he can immediately heal blind eyes and unstop deaf ears, when he can immediately have a couple of loaves and fish and feed 5,000 people. These are miracles. These are mighty miracles. And only Jesus, being the Son of God, being Messiah, being Redeemer, being God himself, only Jesus could be do that. Only Jesus could be called mighty. We're not mighty. Even John the Baptist realized he wasn't mighty for all the importance that John had. And he was important in God's overall salvation plan. He was not mighty compared to Jesus Christ. Jesus ended his mightiness. Remember, he sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Jesus overcame death. Now, let me ask you this. What is more mightier? What is more mightier than overcoming death? You answer me. There isn't anything. You overcome death. You're mighty. Okay, let's go back to John's statement. I hope this is making sense to you as we're breaking this down because this is ultimately leading to John's humility. John realizes who he's dealing with here. He says, there comes one mightier than I. Than I. As important as John's ministry was, he knew that Jesus' ministry was infinitely more important. Infinitely. John was just setting the table as it was. John was setting the table, but Jesus would be the, the lamb sacrificed. John had a part in God's salvation plan. Of course he did. He was pointing the way to Christ. He knew his role. Do you remember in John 3, verse 30, what did John say? He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's humility. That's humility. When we realize who Jesus is, when we recognize that he came into this world to save us from our sins, if he's your Lord and Savior today, you, I'm sure I pray that you are humble before him. Jesus had no obligation to do any of that. God didn't have to save any of us. None of us are deserving of it. But the fact that he did should cause us to drop to our knees in humility. We should be thankful. We should be thanking God every minute of every day that he gives us for his mercy and his grace. And we need to be humble before him. How many times do our own egos get in the way? And we think, well, we don't, we don't need God. or I don't need to pray to God. I don't need to spend the majority of my time thinking about God or serving God. I can do what I want and just show up on church for Sundays. And once in a while, I'll give a few dollars to the church. Is that being humble? When you want to live your life for you and not for God after what he did for you, is that being humble? I think not. I think not. Let's continue in our statement here. There cometh one mightier than I after me. Now, we all know that John was a cousin of Jesus. They were first cousins. John was also six months older. John also started his public ministry, of course, before Jesus did. Because we're going to see Jesus. See, Jesus didn't start his public ministry until he was baptized by John first. And then he spent his three years in ministry. So John realizes that Jesus is going to succeed him in preaching and baptizing. Jesus was coming along after John to be baptized. While John was born first, it's really just a very easy statement that John is saying. Here comes one mightier than I after me. In other words, John is saying, Take your eyes off of me and put your eyes on Jesus. Take your eyes off of me and put your eyes on Jesus. There's coming one after me. I'm going to be disappearing. And we ultimately know, as we read the Gospels, that John was put in prison and he was beheaded. And Jesus was told about that and Jesus carried on with his ministry. Let's continue. Now, here's where the humility comes in at. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. We need to, we need to break that down. What, when we're talking about latchet, we're talking about, like, say, um, a thong or a lace or shoelace, something that, that keeps something on your foot, that goes over top of your foot. That's what he's talking about when he says a latchet. It's something that sandals were, 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 Put together that way. You could think of like a modern day shoelace kind of thing or some kind of a buckle or something. That's what a latchet was. Now let's talk about the shoes he's talking about here. When he says the latchet of whose shoes, we can also say sandals. Now I don't know if you know this, but the very first sandals were very small, thin pieces of wood. And they were put on the bottom of the feet. 
and then you had something attached to them that would tie over top of the feet. You know why they use wood? It stopped people's feet from getting hurt on sharp stones as they're walking across the burning sand. It protected their feet. They were called sandals. Later on, when it became more sophisticated, they started using leather. But originally, it was just a little slab of wood. And so whatever they could use to fasten either that piece of wood or that piece of leather and call it a sandal or a shoe, they had some sort of a latchet or a tie that would tie that. That's what was happening. Sandals did not cover the entire foot. Think of like a, um, I don't know if you know the phrase, a flip-flop. Think of a modern-day flip-flop. It just has the bottom on it. It has a couple little things that go around the top of your feet. That's essentially what we're talking about. So when he's saying... Okay, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and undo this latchet. When you think about that, I am not worthy. John felt and he knew his unworthiness. He was far from being worthy of the high honor that was bestowed on him. Listen, it wasn't just, he was using the shoe as an example. John knew that he wasn't even worthy to announce the coming of the Messiah. That's what God gave him to do. But he realized in the mighty presence of Jesus that he was unworthy of all of this. He was unworthy of being Jesus' a forerunner, his messenger, the person that was, uh, was announcing Jesus to the world. Yes, that's what God called him to do. But John is being humble here. He's showing humility. He's saying, I am not even worthy to step down and untie these things. So let's think about this. When he says, I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose, stooping down represents humility. It represents respect for a person. And when you stoop down and unloose, when a person came to your house, now remember, in those days where they were traveling by walking, whatever, you had dusty roads and so on. And when you came, your feet were dirty. And what you did as the host of a house is that anybody who was visiting your house, you took their shoes off and you washed their feet. Remember when Jesus got the basin and he kneeled down and he washed all of his apostles, all the disciples' feet? He did that to show humility. He did to show that that he was serving other people. Well, here's the thing. When you went into a house, the person who had to stoop down and take apart the sandals and so on and wash the feet was given to the lowest servant or the slave in the house. It was the most menial task. It was the lowest thing that someone could do. So if you were a low person on the totem pole in that house, you were the one that took off all the sandals and washed the feet uh, for any visitor coming into your house. You were the one. And John is saying, you see that John is saying, even that lowest servant, even that lowest servant, I'm not even worthy of doing that. The lowest person in the household, I am not even worthy of doing this to the Lord Jesus. I'm not even worthy. That is humility. That is, that's not thinking less of yourself. That's not having a self-esteem issue. That's not belittling yourself. That is not making you feel that you're, uh, you're totally worthless. It's showing humility. It's showing respect. John doesn't even consider himself worthy to perform even the lowest possible task upon Jesus. He didn't feel worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of Jesus' sandal. That's how powerful, that's how mighty, that's how awesome John the Baptist saw Jesus as. Do you see Jesus the same way? Is he mighty? Is he awesome? Is, is he the Lord of your life? Is he ruling over your life? Can we say, can you say, and can I say, that we have the same attitude when it comes to serving Jesus Christ as John did? Can we say that we are humbled before Christ because of his majesty and his power and what he did for us? If you are born again today, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, he died for you. And we need to be humble before him. So I have three questions that I'm going to ask you and ask myself. And we're going to end this message with these three questions that I want you to think about. I want you to really reflect on it between your relationship and Jesus and see where you are in the humble scale. Question number one, do you have the desire to humbly serve Jesus? Do you have that desire? Is it burning in you? That burning desire to humbly serve Jesus for you to get out of the way 
and let Jesus shine. For you to do humbly what he's called you to do without your ego getting in the way, without you needing to be patted on the back, without needing recognition, without needing some kind of uh, star power. Are you, do you have the desire to humbly serve Jesus? That's question one. Question two, do you ever feel, do you ever feel too self-worthy, too self-important to serve Jesus as he desires us to? Does your ego ever get in the way? Do you ever think you're better than what you think you are? Do you ever say, hey, I'm a born again Christian. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm on easy street. I can do what I want. I'm a Christian. I know my sins are forgiven, so I can do whatever I want. Is that humility? Does your ego get in the way sometimes? Do you think sometimes, well, you know, I'm really something. Do you do that? That's a question you have to ask for yourself. Are you cocky? Are you overconfident? Do you think you're something that you're really not? I'm not talking about us putting ourselves down. I'm talking about humility. I'm talking about recognizing that in the face of Jesus, in the face of Christ, we have no business, no ego. We have no business doing that. Here's the third question. Do you recognize that humility is a characteristic of a true born again believer? If you are a true believer today, do you have that characteristic? Because you should. You should be humble. Think about what was done for you on the cross of Calvary. If you were to die tonight and you were a born again Christian, you know what? You have eternal life. You have eternal life already if you are a born again Christian. You already have it. You have a resurrected soul. You have the promise and the guarantee of eternal life. Our bodies are still aging, of course, because we don't have our glorified bodies yet. But in our soul existence, we're already immortal. Think about that. When you think of all these things, and I'm going to ask these questions one last time before we finish up. For you to think about, it's, this is between you and God. Do you have the desire to humbly serve Jesus? Yes or no? Do you ever feel too self-worthy, too self-important, too egotistical to serve Jesus as he has called you to do? Yes or no? And finally, do you recognize that humility is a characteristic of all true born-again believers? It's a characteristic. It's something you have to have. If you don't have humility, if you don't have true humility, you may want to check yourself. You may want to check yourself. It's an easy sin to fall into, be egotistical. I pray that all of you were blessed by this message. It's a short message. Well, I guess it's a short message, but when I was studying this, just there was so much in this verse, and I'm not I'm taking my time as the Holy Spirit leads. And so this is what he gave us for this week. John's humility. Now here's what I want you to do. If you can answer all of these questions with a yes. Then take out the word John and put your name in there. So I could say Thomas's humility because I have an example here of how I should be humble when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. How I should be. So this is my humility and I pray it's your humility also. If this message has blessed you, please feel free to share it. This, anything that I post, this has nothing to do with me. We're talking humility here. This has to do with God and his word going forward. Isaiah 55, 11 said that his word would not return void. It will reach those people he needs it to reach. Did it reach you today? If it reaches you today, then share it with someone else who needs to hear the message of humility and what true humility is. Share it with someone. Share it with someone because this is God's word. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with me. This is God's word going out. I pray that you have the kind of humility in your life, in your testimony, in your walk with Jesus that we see John the Baptist had. He's an example. Let's look to Jesus with only humbleness in our hearts and in our minds, in our actions, in our words, in everything that we do for Jesus, let it be of a humble spirit. I thank you for watching. God bless you.